Let's uh, read once again from Romans chapter 14. We're talking about uh, inner strength. Say inner strength. And we were talking about two kinds of Christians in any given body. That is a strong Christian and a weak Christian. So let's just go to this passage and <clears throat> continue our discussion. Romans 14, starting on verse 1. Now accept the one who is weak in faith. So Paul is recognizing, although Romans is a very mature church, there are weak members in the church, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. Say opinions. Always make a distinction as to what uh, you believe, whether it is based on your personal opinion or it is based on the word of God. And a lot of people really split up not on the word of God, but on opinion. They become so attached to their own opinions. One person has a faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak, eat vegetables only. Huh? That's not my word, okay? You say, if you believe that the only thing you can eat is vegetables, according to Paul, that's, that's a weaker faith, because you cannot accept that uh, God indeed had used other things to feed us. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls. And he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Now this is pertaining to holidays. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes, the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord. For he gives thanks to God, and he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and give thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Can heaven amen? amen? So those people who say, I live for myself, that's really a very selfish statement because now that we are believers, we live or die for the Lord. <clears throat> amen? But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is, what, what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, we pursue the things... <clears throat> Which, makes, which make for, fee, for peace and the, and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he, who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is a sin. Now, 
Last Sunday night, we uh, briefly discussed this, that there are three areas of division in the body of Christ that has been with us for as long as we can remember. Number one is in the area of food and drink. Say food and drink. And we were discussing that, of course, in the Jewish law, they have, they have a provision for eating meat. But their meat has to be totally drained of blood. Otherwise, it will not be kosher. Okay? Now, because of the current development in food technology, and the dietitians today actually believe that the best diet that we have right now is the Levitical diet. In fact, if you read uh, of Rick Warren, purpose-driven uh, church, something like that. He, now, now, you have to remember, this guy is sick. Okay? He's under medication. It's difficult for him to rest. He could not sleep. He has this tremendous amount of energy that is always surging in his body. And he said that if he doesn't take his, uh, um, you know when you have a regimen of medication, how do you call that? Um, maintenance. If he, doesn't, if, he if he doesn't take that maintenance medication, he could die. Because he will, he will just keep on working. You know, he, he said that when he wrote that book, Purpose Driven Life, he said, it took me two weeks to finish the book. He said, almost with no sleep. He said, I have to take medication to sleep. Now, you know he's overweight. And so he went through this diet. He calls it Daniel diet. And then what, what he did was he, he now requires all of his staff to go through that Daniel diet. Now, some people take an author like that and begin to say, whoa, that's the right thing to do. That's his opinion. Okay. We Filipinos do not need Daniel diet. Yeah, we don't have the problem of overweight like his church does. You know what I'm saying? So you have to, be, to begin to separate opinions. Now this is when you, you will begin to read some books and begin to be attached to it. There is always a cultural background that is filled with opinions that we need to sift from biblical truth. Another thing is this. We as Filipinos, drinking wine or alcohol has always been part of our culture, if you will study our history. Because, uh, I mean, that's, that's the cheapest way for Filipinos to, to have entertainment, you know. But, but the thing is this. The time came because of gambling and the responsibility, drinking wine, became equated with the responsibility. Because a lot of houses in the Philippines lacks the food because the husbands, who's normally the drunkard, will choose to use that for drinking. Now, very different here. You observe here. If a person drinks, what does he do? When he drinks here. He just drink. In the Philippines, when a person drinks, what does he do? What? <laughs> drink some more. <laughs> well, not only drink some more, what, does, what else does he do? No, he finds companions. Right? Nobody drinks alone in the Philippines. So now when he finds companion, who pays for it? He does. The missionaries in the Philippines were amazed uh, of people in the Philippines who drinks, uh, who drinks, they don't drink this, who smoke cigarette. I was about to say who drink cigarette, you know. <laughs> Have you noticed the Filipinos who smokes in the, in the Philippines? They're in the jeepney, right? They'll open a pack of cigarette. Do they just smoke? They operate the person in front of them whom they have no idea what the name is. That's our culture. Do you want some? And what will that Filipino normally say? Of course, that's free. You know, so it's very expensive, something like that. And so drinking became equated with irresponsibility. Lester Samuel said that when we ha he had a revival in the Philippines, there was more food on the table of his members, more money for education, and for other supplies. And he said, it's not because the Filipinos have salary raise. 
But because the drunkards stop drinking, the chain smokers stop smoking, the womanizers start, stop having extramarital affairs, the gamblers stop gambling. So what do you have when you stop doing those things? Extra money. You see? And there you go. You have a tip on how to have extra money. All you need to do is to get rid of unnecessary expenses and you'll have extra money on your, in your pocket. Are you with me? Now, the, the reason why I'm very hesitant in, in, in accepting that rule is because we have other brothers and sisters in other parts of the world wherein they don't even ask the question. I told you, for example, in Germany, all, all, I think all the Christians, they drink. They even have a beer in Germany. By the way, in Germany, when, when you say, get, get me a mug of beer, they don't get a little cup. They get a mug, you know. Uh, they have a beer wherein the label of the beer, it has Martin Luther's picture, and it's 95 theses. So you get born again while drinking. No. <laughs> but that's their culture. It's, in, in fact, you go there and you ask the question, they will even look at you and say, why are you asking the question? It's not an issue. You see, so you cannot, for example, if you're a Filipino coming from the Philippine background, impose that on the Europeans and even some Americans. You see? That's why you have, you have to uh, make a distinction between what is human opinion from biblical doctrine. Now, what is forbidden is what? Drunkenness. Now, I, I'm not telling you right now, go out and have a drink, okay? Because now there is a problem. What if you are dealing with other Filipinos who are still offended by it? The Bible says, although you can drink for the sake of a weaker brother who cannot accept that, refrain yourself. So now you are dealing with offense, and that is what the passage means when it says, you live for the Lord, you die for the Lord. Now it doesn't say, it doesn't mean you commit jihad, okay? To die for the Lord means you will live your life to honor God to the day you die. That's what it means. And so really the basic argument that we have is in mat on matters of offense. The second thing is special holidays. In the Greek culture, certain days are driven by their gods. In the Philippines, almost all of our days have, have, a, have a feast. When we were born, the, the first three of us in my, in my family, my parents were not given liberty to choose our name. My, my grandmother, being a devout Catholic, what she did was took the calendar, you know, and... When, when we were born, who, whoever's day it is, that's our name. Like, like uh, when my kuya was born, we were wondering, what kind of name does my brother have? Actually, he stole my nickname, you know, uh, because Pepe is supposed to, my, to be my nickname, but it can't be my nickname because my kuya is called Pepe. Why? Because his name is named after St. Pelagius. Now, do you have an idea, any idea here who St. Pelagius is? Anybody? I also don't know who he is. I've never met the guy, you know. <laughs> and so we were wondering, what kind of name is that? Well, it's until I became a Christian and I started studying history of theology and I came across this guy. It turned out he's a phenomenal Christian. But I do not know. But Filipinos name their children after that. When my, when my auntie was born, I think they have a celebration called uh, Lady of Lourdes. So my, my sister is Lourdes, you see. When I was born, it's uh, San Jose. No, Jose. St. Joseph is English. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my name. Now we moved to Manila, so when my next sibling was born, my grandmother was no longer around. So their name becomes insignificant, you know. But our feasts in the Philippines, if you cannot get pregnant, there is a feast for... Wala uh, mang Saint Ubandu eh. Santa Clara. <laughs> yeah. Saint, uh, Santa Clara. Who's saying Santa Clara? Saint Clair. 
Is it, is it Saint Clair? Okay. So Santa Clara, you dance before be, before her, and they believe you can get pregnant. Okay. Now, in our feasts, that's why we have a saying: the Philippines is poor, but not the Filipinos, because the poorest among us during these festival days, they will find ways to have a feast in their house. And you know, we have, we have a different feast in the Philippines here. For example, if it's a Thanksgiving day, you invite whom you want to invite. Well, not necessarily in the Philippines. Yeah, you invite whom you invite, but you don't know whom you invite will invite. <laughs> yeah, and who do you, you don't know whom you invite invited, who invites somebody also. And then we have an open door, right? If somebody is next in, and somebody is about to collect your garbage, and you happen to be eating, you don't just say collect the garbage. You ask the garbage collector, do you want some food? And so, all of those are food dedicated to idols. We don't know that during the time. By this, now Paul encountered the same thing in the, uh, in the Gentile churches. No problem with the Jews. They don't observe those. But now, that's what Paul encountered in the Gentile churches. Now, Paul knew all food is clean, and there's nothing wrong with those food. So this is what Paul said. Do not ask any question. Yeah. You go to the feast, you're hungry, you eat. Now, if you ask questions, don't eat. Because by you asking questions, your conscience is weak. You have sinned. Now, if somebody comes along and saw Erwin eating and said, I thought you're a Christian. Why are you eating this food? He should refrain from eating. Why? Because he offends me. The problem is not that he sinned. He did not sin at all. The problem is I am weak. It offended me. So he has to stop eating. Not for his sake, but for my sake. Why do I do that? Because we live for the Lord. And the basic rule really is this, that you do not put any stumbling block on a brother or a sister. You, know, so you don't say, oh, look at me, I'm, I'm vegetarian, I'm better than you. You don't do that. That's offense. You don't say, oh, look at me, I eat sausage. You know, and, and you don't. You don't do that. That's offensive. The main thing is, we don't offend one another. Okay? And, and of course, with that, the argument becomes what is offensive and not offensive. And so, uh, th th those are three things. Now, let me read to you again Mark 7, 18. And he said to them, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that what, whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated. Thus he declared all food clean. Okay, now he declared all food clean. By the way, there is an argument on this passage because of the parentheses that that is an addition. Okay, no, I'm not going into textual criticism and all of those things because Mark certainly is Jewish. And, and uh, we don't know what type of address they are, they are trying to, what type of issue they're trying to, to, uh, to address. But you will remember that in first. Uh, no, in Acts chapter 15, the Gentile church expanded. Now understand this. Although the Gentile church expanded, each of these Gentile church had Jewish constituency. Okay? There is a theory in biblical writing, uh, we call it New Testament primacy. Okay? What is that term? When you talk about New Testament primacy, you're talking about what language the New Testament was written. So what language was the Old Testament written? Hebrew, right? You know that. So what language was the New Testament written? What? What happened? Are you guys asleep? What language is the New Testament written? Greek. However, that is not, that, that is changing. Okay, there is a doctrine for over 100 years called 
uh, New Testament primacy because they have evidences proven by what is in the scriptures that some of these books were actually written in Hebrew, especially the book of Matthew. Because if you look at the book of Matthew, the Hebrew version, and put it side by side with the Greek translation, the, the Greek translation actually match Hebrew, uh, Hebrew, uh, Hebrew language, like it was just translate, uh, translated as much close as possible. The other thing is this. If you notice, you are, uh, you are reading, for example, there are three, three groups of four, 14 generations, I think, in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, right? If you look at that, the last one, it's lacking one name. It's only 13. So Christians are wondering, how come it says 14, it's only 13? Well, because you're reading from the Greek translation. But the Hebrew version of Matthew chapter 1, there are 14 names. Yeah. Abner is included. So there are 14 names. So actually there are, there are textual difficulties in the New Testament that if you read it on the Hebrew version, it's actually no problem. Like there are, there are passages that they attributed, I think, to Isaiah. You look at the scriptures, it's actually from the prophet Zechariah. But in the Hebrew version, it says Zechariah, not Isaiah. Yeah. So these are, these are the things. So why, why am I saying that? Because the writers of the New Testament are all Jewish. None, none of them are Gentile. You, you guys have to understand that. Now, if they are writing it from the Jewish, if the Jews are, were writing it, then they are, they are very aware that now some of their audience are Gentiles. Those Gentile churches have Hebrew members, have, have, uh, and, and they were trying to adopt. And so, and so in Acts 15, they come to the forefront because everybody wants to circumcise. Everybody wants to observe all of these things. You know what, what the apostles said? They said, hey, listen, let us, not, let us not put undue burden on these new believers. I mean, it's, it's just like somebody got born again. And a lot of people who are newly born again get offended because they come to the church and they say, hey, look at your haircut, huh? Make it four side wall. Look at your shoes. It should be black. Look at your socks. It has flowers. <laughs> what in the world is that? That's offensive. And so now you, you, lo <laughs> you, <laughs> you load him with all, of this, <laughs> with all of these opinions. Now he just, he just got out of hell. He just got born again. And now you, you uh, daunt him with all kinds of what Paul says, regulations. Hey, listen, when you go to school, you are in pre-K, most of the time you're just playing. You don't start on the first day of your pre-K and your teacher opens a book on calculus. The baby will die. <laughs> you know, when, when the baby is born, you give him milk. You don't even give him Gerber food. Just give him milk. His stomach cannot handle it. Now this is where wisdom and tact becomes necessary for us who assume we are more mature. Remember we had a member here before, we have a Bible school class, and he keeps attending, keeps attending. And then when he keeps attending, one of the old members of this church come to him and say, well, are you trying to be a pastor? You're always around when pastor says teaching. The guy left. Yeah. We have, we have one member that one of our members had the relationship with him keep cursing him. R real curse. <laughs> Including Filipino curse that he didn't even un understand. And he told me, what, what kind of Christian is that? He cur she cursed me all the time. Well, the guy left. You see, you overburden him with too many things. What does, the what, does, what does a baby do? Eats, sleeps, and poops. Right? Makes a lot of mess. You don't mind that. But if he is seven years old, you do mind that. <laughs> Meaning that these Christians that are newly born again will one day grow up. And how you deal with them matters because they could be offended if you, if you don't handle them 
properly. And so this phrase in Romans 14 becomes extremely important. We live and we die for the Lord. Make, make a distinction with your opinion. Now, there are, in our walk of faith, there are certain things that we certainly prefer and don't prefer. For example, I was mentioning that I really, in, in music, I really like hymns. In fact, I like, I like instrumental music. I don't even want anything with lyrics. Yeah, I have a lot of uh, recorded music that are just instrumental. The instrumental music ministers to me more than the one with uh, words because I end up analyzing the words. I end up saying, my goodness, what, what kind of lyric is this, you know? John Wesley and Charles Wesley always fight. Charles Wesley composed over 2,000 hymns. But uh, John Wesley will always rebuke his brother and say, brother, what kind of lyrics are you putting in your songs? They are not according to the scriptures. And Charles will say, well, this music, you know, and all of those things. Well, I, I like hymns. I appreciate it when people rearrange hymns into contemporary tune. But the modern songs that we have right now, that I, I will listen to my daughter and my sons to their music. I say, what, what kind of music is that? You know, and I don't even turn on my radio, on my car. I, I don't know why I pay for that. But if there is still a car with no radio, that's what I will buy. I don't like radio in the car. I, I don't like music in the car. That's just the type of person that I am, you know. But even though I prefer hymns, I don't go to Hansel and say, Hansel, I'm the pastor, all hymns. Now what will happen to our young people? They will look like hymns, you know. And they will begin to look like hymns. Because the music of the youth is different. You know what I'm saying? There is even what we call right now as rap music. And the Christians are adapting to it. There are some good uh, Christian rappers now. But when, it, when that, but when it started, some pastors are preaching against it. Now, if you are preaching against rap music, well, you've got members who love rap music. What did you just do? You offended them. What you have to realize is make a differentiation between your opinion and what is Bible. Even Paul. You know, when Paul said, because of current crisis, it's better that you don't get married. You know, there are really times when it's better not to get married. For example, if our economy tanked and there's shortage of food and then there's shortage of job, don't go to your mom and say you're getting married. Because in natural processing, it's not the right time. But if you cannot stop yourself, because you're burning, it's better to get married than burn. But Paul said this, I don't have a word from the Lord, this is just my opinion. You see? And a lot of people do not know how to make a distinction between their opinions. You know, I have a, I have a dear brother, uh, you know, he likes communion every week. I don't. Yeah. Why? S simply because it's opinion. As often as you could. Well, how is how often? Do we do it every day? These are personal opinions, you see. Because now my spiritual father, like Samuel said, in his years of ministry, he observed that it's better to do it once a week because people begin to take it as common, okay? And he said, over familiarity, some, it's, it's just like some of our kids. Uh, they don't bother with it anymore. They, it, it's just a ritual. There's no more meaning to it. It becomes common, you see. So you balance that. Is there a biblical instruction how many times per week? None. That is your opinion. Now, if I begin to preach that you are sinning because you're not doing it every week, that becomes wrong because you are now making your opinion equal to the Word of God. Are you listening? You know, these, these are the things. Some of you, you may not like certain kinds of clothes, the only rule that we have is everything should be done with decency. So you look decent. For as long as you look decent, that's okay. You know? 
my, my, my son here wears some socks that I would like him to eat, you know. But it's, it's his weird opinion that, that uh, those socks are good. He, he even ordered them, them online, you know. And I said, why in the world are you? He has socks like you, you know. I don't know where you guys come from. But, 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 uh, but these are just personal opinions, you know. And these personal opinions does not affect your salvation. And so, loosen up a little bit, you know, and, and begin to realize that there are enough instructions in the scriptures. However, after saying that, then, let me read this to you so that you can, you can get it better. Acts 17, verse 10. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. For they received the words with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so or not. Now, comparing two Gentile churches, number one is uh, the Bereans. There is a school in New York called Berean Bible College, because name after this. And there is a church in Thessalonica, a church in Thessalonica. Well, it turned out the church in Thessalonica were not as uh, ardent in pursuing the truth as the Bereans. You know how some Christians, a preacher, preach, say amen, they say amen. And whatever they say, they just embrace. Those are weak Christians. Yeah. Uh, those are weak Christians. Right attitude is, if the person is quoting the scriptures, if the person is teaching the truth, you embrace it, but then you be- verify. The Bereans were now called more noble. Now that is a very important term. Because more noble is associated with vessels unto honor. Okay? Vessels unto honor are those who are used properly by God, but these are Christians who can receive words from you because you're a fellow believer, but then will search the scriptures daily. And so, you know, some, some preachers are fascinated when everybody screams amen when they preach. And when I started going back to the Philippines, I will sometimes stop people because they'll say amen on anything I say. And you test they say amen while they are falling asleep. Because you say, say amen. Amen. What happened? Amen. <laughs> you are agreeing on something you don't understand. To be a noble Christian, you need to be able to take words being preached and verify it from the scriptures. So what, what have we lost now in the church? Debates. Question and answers and arguments. Now, remember what I told you? The church is not patterned after the temple. I know who started the idea that it's patterned. It's not patterned. We don't have the Ark of the Covenant. We don't have the priestly vestments. We don't have the incense. We don't have all of those. We are patterned after the synagogues. Now, why is it very important? Because when the synagogues were first formed, the faith community was in dispersion. They had no temple. Now remember, temple was, was uh, the center of prayer was temple and houses, not even synagogue to begin with. Synagogue was, was a center of learning. So the, the, the Jewish community, the believing community, begin to gather together and say, how do we make sense of the Torah? We are in exile. And they are, they are wondering, how in the world are we going to apply the scriptures? That's why if you read some of their writings, you will find a lot of excerpts on the arguments and, and what does this rabbi think, what, how does this rabbi uh, apply the scriptures, because they're struggling. How in the world are we going to make sense of the Torah in, while we are in exile? Now we have lost that. The church, we, what, what saddens me is, Ephesians chapter 4 becomes a negative truth to us. Maturity should be we are not blown by every kind of doctrine. 
You know? Now we are blown by every kind of doctrine. Somebody laughs there, we laugh with them. Why are you laughing? Well, ito uso eh. You know, people start rolling here, we roll also. No, I'm not saying anything is wrong with those things. What I'm saying is, gaya gaya, we just keep mimicking these symptoms without knowing the spirit. You know, when people are stretching legs, we stretch legs also. We, we become uh, copycats. We become like monkeys who just keeps copying everybody. Paul said, no. You need to be able to search the scriptures daily. You know, uh, Peter said this, you know, anybody who teach you, who mocks those who study, don't believe them. Because, because study to show yourself a proven to God, a man who, did, who needed not to be ashamed, rightly or accurately handling the word of truth. So when people begin teaching, oh, these people study, yeah, he studied. You know why he studied? Because I, I do not know. And I have to learn. And so now we have preachers mocking, studying. You don't mock that. Because, because uh, preaching and teaching is a staple ministry in the church. And so you mock that, you're actually eliminating a very big portion of ecclesiastical ministry, you know. And, and in fact, what we should be doing is learning. You know, my, my, my friends wonder why I talk the way I talk because I told them, you guys worship Calvin and Arminius. I said, you guys don't even realize it. We know more than John Calvin now. Why? Because we read John Calvin. John Calvin doesn't even know we exist. John Calvin was, was uh, struggling during his days. And, and, and the same struggles we, we did not experience. But now we have read his writings. But some people take writings like that and uh, count it like scriptures. So we have Calvinist churches. We have Armenian uh, churches based on on uh, Jacobus Arminius. All we need to have is to be the church of Jesus Christ. Of course, not of Latter-day Saints, okay? Just the, the, body, of, the body of Christ. Uh, and so we have to value th th these things. D differentiate between what is your opinion and what is not your opinion. And so, if you can, if you can handle people's ideas and debate on them, um, and be, be able to argue, and be able to weigh in opinions, and then look at the scriptures and say, this is what the scripture says, you know. And, and I think that's, that's maturity. Uh, that's why you, 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 look, you look at how scripture is applied by our faith, ancestors, men. You know, at one time, uh, Jews were made slaves. I, I forgot what era was this. And so the rabbis begin to say, we need to redeem these slaves. And, and if a ship with Jewish slaves is going to dock on the port, he, he will tell the Jews, buy those slaves, buy those slaves. And I read one, one writing that says, if you run out of money, even your money for food, gather it to buy the Jewish slaves. Now, that's charity that is unheard of even among some Christians. You know, that, that, that you are willing to do everything to redeem a fellow believer. Now, that is, that is some community is struggling with how, how are we going to apply the scriptures? You know, do, do we still have that? That's why now we believe something, we can't even reason. Why, why do you believe in this? Well, my pastor said that. My mother said that. Well, that's how shallow you are. Well, the, the guest is speaking. Look at him. He's, he's so good. He prayed for us. Everybody fell down. So, so what happens next? Well, I don't know, but, but we do it by faith. No, you're not doing it by faith. You're being ignoble. Because the Bereans will take the, the words of Paul and search the scriptures daily. You know, that's why when new ministers come, uh, remember at one time we have a guest here and he said, well, I'm not really looking for a wife. And I immediately said, of course you are. And he corrected himself. Well, because I don't tolerate garbage like that. Because whenever we were talking, he's talking about finding a wife. He's even asking for my help. And then you're going to stand up and say you did not look for a wife. That's, that's terribly wrong. 
you know. And this is what I'm saying. You need to be able to weigh in these things. Oh, Pastor, so you're too much. You're, you're, you're thinking too much. Of course, God gave me brains. What do you want me to do with it? Turn it into bulalo or something? I cannot do that. You know, you have, you have, you have to balance this out to your body, soul, and spirit. And, and our constituency and our constitution has to be very, very strong. Well, now, this is the rule, though. You cannot touch those things that are fundamentals in the Word of God, like, the, like Jesus uh, died and the third day rose again. You cannot change that. Now, I'll give you this. You cannot change the Sabbath. Have you read the Bible in Genesis before sin? It's, it's forever before sin. That's one of the things that Jesus will restore when he comes back. That's why when Christians, they talk about the Sabbath like, like it's gone. Hey, listen, I challenge all of you. Show me in the scriptures it's gone. It's not gone. That's one of the first things that Jesus will, will reinstate because people have been violating the Sabbath. The, my Bible tells me this is forever. Are you listening? I don't know how we're going to celebrate the Sabbath when Jesus returns, but that is going to be forever. I mean, what, is, what does forever mean? Forever, you see. So some people try, thou shalt not commit adultery. That is non-negotiable. You, you can't say, well, you know, according to, to Ted Turner, it's common for married couples to, to, to commit adultery two or three times in their mar married life. That's his fallen opinion. But that opinion is overruled by the word of God. Cleave unto your wife. Now, do Christians violate that? Yes. But the word of God doesn't change. And so sometimes we are, we are taking human opinion and making it equal with the word of God. So another rule is this. Do not think of yourself as superior to others. By the way, even for example, I was mentioning this, even the rapture of the saints. People are arguing, is it before the great tribulation, in the middle of the great tribulation, or at the end of the great tribulation? It doesn't matter what you believe. The moment the rapture takes place, Jesus is not going to say, those only who believe in pre-trib will be raptured. No, it's the body of Christ that will be raptured. You know? Because I can prove from the scriptures that there are people who will be gone before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, and at the end of the tribulation. You can prove all of those points. Maybe all of that has to be combined. Those are opinions. But the truth that is unalterable is Jesus is coming back again. You can't say he will no longer be coming back. So, you cannot think of yourself more superior than others. When you begin to teach and say, this is it, as extreme fundamentalism, you are no longer open to any opinion, that becomes very dangerous. Now, I talked about debate earlier, right? Now, now this is, this is something that you have to put into perspective. The main reason why we have unhealthy debates is because we have ignorant and uninformed people debating. When you are coming on a debate table and you are ill-informed and you do not know, you're going to bring nothing. You see? That's why you have to learn. You have to study the scriptures. You have to read the Bible. Otherwise, you will be subject to the whims of others. So what we need to do is to be prayerfully involved with another uh, in, in what we call as a, a Bible study. Or uh, uh, remember when, when we talk about iron sharpens iron, you know, that is, that, is, that is us discussing the word of God. Jesus walks in where two or three are gathered together in my name. Actually, that's in that context. When two or three are gathered together in his name and they're discussing the scriptures, what happened? Jesus walks in. An example is, remember the two disciples on the road to Emmaus? That's the picture. They were discussing, they're saying, they're struggling with the words of Jesus. And they're saying, man, we, we thought he is the one. 
but he died. Not only, not only that, not only did he die. Can you imagine one of the girls? And even Peter said, they went to the tomb and he's not there. Oh, the Romans are saying, the disciples stole the body. What is going on? And Jesus walked in. Why did Jesus walk in the conversation? Because they were discussing the word of God. That's why you will notice when, for example, even now, this is, this is no discussion, this is not Friday night. When I'm teaching like this, have you noticed you have, you have some thoughts that comes and flash through your mind and you begin to deliberate on them on your own? And then there are some passages that suddenly comes to life. You know why? Because Jesus is here. Why is he here? Because where two or three are gathered, he is right in the midst, in the mix of what we're doing. I like what uh, Dr. Yonggi Cho said. His dad won't get saved. You know, being, being a Buddhist and all. And he's already a pastor. So he would witness to his father, even after the Lord healed him. I mean, literally gave him, he was supposed to be dead. And he was healed. The father saw that. But they believe Buddha can make miracles. So he would not get saved. Well, finally, there was this American missionary who visited this church. And because he knows English, he is the interpreter. And when, when he stood up, he saw his dad in the church. So he said, oh, this is my chance. I'm going to, my dad thinks the American preacher is the one preaching. He said, I'm not going to interpret what he's saying. I'm going to preach my own message. So the American preacher was preaching and Yong Gi Cho, because the American preacher don't know Korean. So Yong Gi Cho began to preach his own message. Sometimes he said that the, the American preacher will be wondering, he will be telling jokes and nobody will be laughing. <laughs> and he said, he said sometimes there, there, will be, there will be no joke and he will crack a joke and people will be laughing and the American missionary will be looking, are you, are you translating right? Yes, yes, this is Korea, you know. And all of those things. He gave the altar call and the dad got saved. And Yong Gi said he was patting himself on his shoulder and saying, I'm really a good preacher, you know. My dad got saved. So he talked to his dad. Dad, how did you like the sermon? He said, what sermon? Well, the sermon that, them, that I was interpreting. He said, no, I'm not after that. He said, well, the preacher was preaching. Jesus showed up. God gave him a vision. Jesus showed up behind the preacher. And he said, I saw Jesus. That's why I got saved. Huh? So what did Jesus do? He walked in the discussion. That's why, now you will begin to understand the scriptures in Luke. Now, while Jesus was preaching, the presence of God was present to heal. Are you listening to me? Because he is here, the moment you receive the word of God and participate in the eating of spiritual manna, that, that gives sustenance. That's why it is important that when we come together, we are prepared to receive the word of God. I mean, you should not, when I teach like this, you should not be learning from what I am teaching. Okay? You should be learning from what the Spirit of the Lord is is awakening in your spirits. Because then it becomes our discussion with him. That's why sometimes I'll be teaching and somebody will come to me after the service. And you know, Pastor say, I remember this and remember that. Where did that come from? Well, the Prince of Jesus walks in, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there he is in the midst. And so I have no doubt in my mind, Jesus is here. Amen? So, uh, those, those are the spirit-transforming trans, things. Now, another rule is this. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. And we have to really pay attention to this. Having said all of that, we need to recognize there is still such a thing as heresy. Say heresy. Heresy is basically another teaching of another kind, you know, that is, that is uh, opposite to what you are believing. Galatians 1, verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven 
should preach to you another a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you. He is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say it again now, if any man was, is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. We have to make a distinction between, between what is orthodox Christianity and what is opinion or, or a heretical teaching. What are the teachings that are uh, disseminate, disseminating in, in Galatia? Jesus, Paul, Paul said, you started in faith, now you think you should finish in work. You started in the spirit, now you think you can complete it in the flesh. When you started, it's all Jesus, now it's all you. That's the heresy, you see. When you begin to think that you can earn God's blessing, that's heresy. That's another gospel. You see? That's why this is, this is where, you know, I, I struggle, for example, especially with... Uh, with uh, 100 fold return teaching. When you begin to say you, you, need, you need money, give, give to God, 100 fold return. Whoa, 100 fold return is, is an idiom, it's a, it's a Hebrew idiom actually, those multiple returns, meaning there will be abundant return. That's all it is. It's not, it's not a number per se. Okay? So now people begin to say, well, I need $100,000, I'm going to give $1,000. That's not Bible. You see? So now you have people on television saying, send me $20, I'll give you a prayer cloth. That's not Bible. Yeah, that's not Bible. I'm telling you. Wait, what is Bible? Somebody anointed is preaching. And you have a mother who is sick. So what did they do to Paul? Paul, my mom cannot come here. He's living in Turkey. You're in Jerusalem. I need her to get healed. Paul says, well, bring her here. Well, she cannot come here. Can you give me your handkerchief, please? So Paul took his handkerchief where he blew his nose on. Yeah. Where he wiped his sweat. Now remember, there was no air condition. And it came from the body of Paul. Now that's the key there. While he was ministering under the anointing and gave it to this guy and he put it on his mom and the mom got healed. What do the preachers now? They buy five meters of textile material, cut it in one by one inch, and ask for $20 each. That is not Bible. Why did that come off his body? You want something from my body? Get my socks. <laughs> That's why it is. And I won't give it to you. That's, That's why it is. You know, and, and, and they take the handkerchiefs and, and they begin, and aprons, they not, cut it with scissors. They, they put it on the, on the patient. But now some people come up with the idea they can make money out of it. That, that is my, my struggle because, because I have read my Bible. It's not there. You know, and you begin to preach that and say, oh, you're full of unbelief. No, I'm not. Prove to me that what I'm teaching you is not from the scriptures. But if what you're teaching is not from the scriptures, then you're operating out of unbelief. Because it's not based on what is biblical faith. Amen. You see. Are you still awake? Okay. So, so now we live, we live or die uh, to the Lord. There is a movie that was just shown, The Life of uh, Richard Wormbrandt. You know, tortured for Christ. I told you, among the men of God I have met, uh, I, I felt most privileged having met Richard Warman. I have not sensed any hatred or animosity from this guy. I mean, I, I, I put him in my old Ford 323, uh, and, and the, the car that and the Ford, yeah, Ford, my first car, Boy, the, the, the car is rotten, you know. I have to stop it every 45 minutes. And, and he was a guest to Patro, and so my, my friend, his interpreter, he was in that car, and he, he doesn't complain. And Ovidio was complaining to him. At the end, he says, Ovidio, Ovidio. 
do not complain. They're just different. And Obidjo told me, I was rebuked by that statement. You know. Why, why is it? Uh, because this guy, he would preach to any church. Yeah, he, he would just preach. He will, Obidjo tell me, he, if he goes to the Orthodox churches, he wears their, their vestments. And he will always tell Obidjo, if not wearing their vestments offends them, I will wear them so I can preach. He will, he will be to any man. Because that is not part of his faith. But then remember when the communists uh, met all the ministers and began to say, this is what you will preach. And his wife told him, Richard, you cannot agree with that. The communists are teaching us not to teach the scriptures. And his wife told him, and he said to his wife, well, wife, either I agree with them or what you have is a dead husband. Because he said, if I oppose them, they will put me in jail and they will kill me. And his wife, wife said, well, a dead husband is better than a coward. That's what the wife said. A dead husband is better than a coward. And it rebuked Richard. And so he stood against communism. And he was put in jail for 14 years. But can you imagine the strength of the wife? Some wives will say, Oh, sige na, sige na, you know. You. Remember, I don't know if you see the movie, The Kingdom of Heaven. The priest said, Convert to Islam and repent later. Well, a lot of Christians are like that. So, uh, so weak, they could not stand for what they believe. Even if they see it from the scriptures. But, but the wife of Richard Wamron says, well, I would prefer a dead husband over a coward. And, so, and Sabrina just, just reminded him, the Bible says, if you are not willing to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of me. You see? When you begin to think of, of that, how how this couple apply the scriptures, how they struggle. And then we begin to see how we apply the scriptures. We, we, are, we are afraid we will scare our, we will offend our dog, you know. So we don't go to church because the dog is going to be hungry. We are afraid we're going to offend the cat or something like that. Well, this is life and death, applying the scriptures. And this is where we, we refuse to deliberate on now. Oh, I'm, I'm going to lose my friend. This woman is going to lose her husband. And she did for 14 years. She did for 14 years. You know. And, and these are the kind of things that, that are still going on. What about those, those Afghanis, the Christians? Remember, remember that one, one village? They killed the men, Christians? Oh, the, the West, we read the news. Oh, how terrible, how terrible. Well, the, the community came that Sunday in their, in their celebration of the Lord's Day. And you know what they said? What a privilege to have our men called by God to be martyrs of the faith. And they celebrated these martyrs. While us in the West, we cry over it. And they say it's a privilege. That's the application of faith. Now, why, why do we have discussed this? Because our times here in the U.S. are not getting easier. Our faith is on trial. And if you don't know where you stand, you may just lose your footing. And too many of us are just more than willing to compromise. Well, in my opinion, that's your opinion. Make a distinction between what is Bible and what is your personal opinion. Okay, so again, verse 7 of Romans 14, for not one of us live for himself and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. We are the Lord's. Now remember that what, what, what we have been talking earlier was food, holidays, and drink. One's strength or weakness as a question can be measured by how you view these things. Now we come to one of the ultimate determinants 
of our, of our strength or weakness. Well, I like that food. I don't care if you don't like it. If you can't handle it, tough. Huh? You're living for yourself, you see. The church in Rome was in danger of division. Now, my observation and practical learning is all goes down to pride. Some people will do everything to feed their pride even if they know it's costing them a lot. Now, Paul has a learning. What was his learning? The church in Corinth. Okay. They celebrate the Lord's Day. And we read from the scriptures, right? So when they celebrate the Lord's Day, they don't do it the way we do it. Ours is very sanitized, hygienic and everything. We have little cups. They don't have that in those days. The Lord's table is really the Lord's table. You eat. So they will have a celebration of the Lord's Day and then they're going to have food. So they'll be eating. If there are 500 members, 500 members will be eating. Now remember, there are no cars, so nobody can just jump and eat, you know. So they bring their food. And in the midst of that festivity, the preacher will do what Jesus did. Take a bread, break it, and begin to celebrate the Lord's communion. This is my body. Normally from one loaf of bread, they'll, they'll all break from it, and then, and then wine. Now remember, they were eating, so it's real wine. Because water can give them a stomach problem. So they always mix their drink with wine or they drink wine so that they will not have a stomach upset. And so they will break that and that's how the Lord's feast is. Now, in any church, there are, there's always rich and there's always a poor. So the rich will be bringing their food. And the poor sometimes will have nothing or very little thing. Well, the rich said, said, I, I brought this food. I have my, my family with me. Hey, let's eat. Dad, the, the, the message is not yet done. This is what they were doing. Yeah, but if, if we wait for the message to be done, and everybody will see us get our food. Let's eat now. So they'll, they'll go and start eating. And they'll get, they'll get their jars of wine and begin to, to drink. Because they don't want to share it with people. And so some people who are very gluttonous, oh, I like your food, take advantage and eat the food. And so what happened? Not everybody has food left. So the communion is about to start. Not everybody has eaten. That's the context. That's why Paul wrote this in, uh, in Romans because, because Romans was uh, established a theology of these things. So what happens? Selfishness and pride. I, I cook this. This is mine. Well, you look at the other members. Those who have nothing. And that is when you will begin to apply the scriptures. Look after the weak and the poor. Now Jesus said this. The poor you will always have it with you. So the moment there is the Lord's feast and the poor is with you, you give them food first. Because they have nothing that weak. Yeah, you have plenty. Do not use it and dangle it in front of people because now they have nothing and, and they are hiding their food. I, I don't know if, if that happens to you when, well, if, if you're not from the Philippines. When, when we started working in the Philippines, we will pack our lunch. Yeah. Why? Because lunch is expensive. I used to bring lunch to my uncles uh, when they were working in the shipyard. But now I'm working, so I will bring lunch. What happens if you are poor? What do you bring for lunch? Skyplex. Basta may nalang margarine, di ba? Mr. Margarine, papatangkad. Yeah. Well, you will have tomato and dried fish. Right? Or tinapa. To you, right? Dried fish or sardines. Now, when that is your lunch, you don't open it up and say, welcome. You, you cannot go to the corner and... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because you're a little bit embarrassed because, because uh, you can't even offer bigger food. Well, then some people with, with very good food, they will open it up 
You, you smell the food. So you, 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 you take your dried fish and you smell the other one. <laughs> you know? That's how you do it. So now the, the church in, in the first century is the same. Oh, but the rich people, they are bragging on their wealth and neglecting the poor among them. That is the context of what Paul is saying. And so Paul is saying, we're about to have a communion. And some of us have not eaten yet. And that is the context when he said, nobody should partake of the communion unworthily. You are gluttonous, don't take communion. Yeah. Of course, the other context is those who commit adultery and those who are living in sin, they're not supposed to partake of the communion. That's the context. But we are neglecting those things. Matthew 16, 26. If you cannot give your food or drink, how can you give your life to Jesus? When people say, well, my life is to Jesus. Yeah, you can't even share your food. You cannot, you cannot say that. That's really antithetical, okay? Look at this, Matthew 16, 26. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What will it profit a man? That's why suicide is one of the most selfish thing to do. Unless, of course, okay, let me tell you this, unless, unless, of course, and psychologists have proven this, a person commits suicide because of mental illness or mental incapacitation. Have you heard of Rodney Brown, the guy who started what, is, what was known as the Laughing Revival? The reason for that revival is simple. He was living in South Africa. He's got a brother who is married. The wife just gave birth to a new child. <clears throat> they were poor. And because they were in debt and they were in a lot of problem, the brother could not handle it anymore. He committed suicide. Well, when he committed suicide, he left nothing. Yeah. Not only did he left nothing, he left something, debts. And he said he was in the grave site when his brother was being married, and he said he was very upset. They're, they're all Christians. He said, I was very upset inside. He was, in his mind, he said, I was rebuking my brother. He was telling me, his, his brother, why, why did you commit suicide? Your wife is young. She just gave birth to a new baby. And you have so much debt. Why did you leave this to your wife? To pay for it. I'm, I'm telling you, some of you guys, you need to get insurance, you know, just in case you die first. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't leave debts to your, to your family and let them pay for it, you know. There are certain things you can do to prevent that from happening. And so, Randy Brown was saying, he was very upset inside. Why did you commit suicide? And he said, while I was saying that in my mind, he said, he heard the devil laugh. Yeah. The devil started laughing at him. Laughing at the whole situation. And he said this, I'm going to do my best to cast you out. I'll chase you out wherever I see you. And he said, no wonder when God started using me in revival, one of the results is laughter. It's because the devil laughed at him when his brother committed suicide. That's the history of that, you see. That's why, that's why, look, we live or die for the Lord. What's the main difference between these two? Dying happens how many times? Once. What about living? It's extended <laughs> reality, you know. Dying is easy. You die. Oh, but living. Living can be hard. Living, you have ups and downs. 
Now your, your spouse is hugging you and kissing you. You turn around, he is cursing you. And then you struggle with, with realities. Now you say, you're, you're asking your family, let's go out and eat. We have, we have extra cash. The following day, boy, we have bills. I've lost my job. Life can be hard. But Jesus said, but, but Paul said, whether you live or die, you live for God. The, the, the most difficult, the most challenging aspect of that passage is in living, not in dying. Dying is easy, but living, you know, living is, whew. so I told the Lord, you know, God, when I'm done with my missions on earth, let me go. I, I look at the struggles of some of the old people. Have you, have you been to nursing homes, guys? I go to the nursing homes. I said, Lord, don't let me die here. I, I do. I pray for the... She just walking like this. You know. Nobody talking to them. I look at them and I say, man, they live all their lives working hard perhaps and then you're just going to dump them in a nursing home? I, I don't know what's going to happen to my kids when they were young. And stupid, you know, they all promised me, especially my wife, and they'll take care of us. But they're getting older. You know, when kids get older, you know what happened to them? They think they're smart. So they change their minds, you know. So I told the Lord, Lord, the moment I'm done, please, just, just take me home. I don't want anybody cleaning me up, you know. I want to hear my kids speaking behind me wishing I'm dead so that they can get my house. <laughs> you know. But that is just my, me thinking. Oh, that's, I'm, I'm telling you. Living can be very, very challenging. But it is in living where you actually apply your faith. Huh? When you lost something, when you lost someone, when you become depressed, when you're stressed out, how do you pull these faith words from the scriptures and apply it in your life? When you are betrayed, when you are abandoned, when you are happy, when you are sad, when you have good news, when you have bad news, how do you apply faith in the midst of all of those things? And so Paul said, we do not live in relation to ourselves, but in relation to God, then to others. This is why also abortion is evil. Yeah. Because you live or die for God. Ah, that's my right. You know, I, I think our discussion shifted from what the scripture says to what is my right. It becomes my right. Well, what about the baby inside? Now I think they have a law in Virginia and in, in, in New York. Even after the baby is born, the, the, the parents can opt not to let the baby survive. What happened to that? You see? You know, the, sad to say, per capita, the highest abortion, I think, is happening in Israel. Now, the amazing thing, the contradiction is this, Okay? There's, there's death penalty in the Bible. But the rabbis made it almost impossible to execute anybody because of the primacy of life. But per capita, I think they have the highest abortion rate. You begin to look at that and you begin to say, whoa, what's going on? That's the struggle. People are wondering, how are they applying the scriptures? That's why we live or die for the Lord. What happens if you are teaching something and then your family gets affected? You know, I have heard preachers, they're very strong on morality. They're very strong on standards until something wrong happens to their family. Then they change their doctrine. Well, it will hurt others because they've been trying to follow you. Even those who supposedly died in their own terms, I'm telling you, if they could help it, they would like to survive. John 16, John 15, 13. 
what this uh, the issue of life and death and love John 15:13 greater love has no one than this that one lays down his life for his friends to live for God and to live for others boy it needs some strength that's how you know you are strong there's a movie I watched. Uh, it was uh, Daniel Craig, Defiant, Defiant, something like that. But Jewish survivors when they were being killed, and they were in the forest. Remember, the, I don't know if you. If you well, I, I like that scene. And the people were complaining, "Ah, they're gonna kill us. What? Are, how are we gonna fight back?" Because some people said, "Let's attack them. Let's kill them." And the leader says, "No. Of course, they'll defend themselves and they'll kill them." And I say. But how do we win? He said, we survive. You know, he said, we survive. That's how we win. What they want the most is to kill us. We survive. We survive, we win. That's primacy of life. You see? And, and when you begin to say this, greater love has no one than this to lay down his life for his friends. Oh, Christians will, oh, I lay down my life for, yeah, you can't even give your food. How can you lay down your life you, you easily offend others. Now, listen, all, all our actions, oh, I'm going to, I don't care if they're offended, I'm going to go to the bar, I'm going to go to the nightclub and get, get drunk. Well, your brothers are being offended, your friends are being offended. You are witnessing to your friends, and your friends says, what kind of Christian are you? Well, I have my own liberty. No. You can't say you're willing to lay down for your life for your friends because you love them, even if that, area of your life, you can't even give in, you know. These are, these are honest-to-goodness discussions on how we apply truth in the scriptures. You know, do well, this is mine, this is yours. No, you don't do that. To live for God is to live for others, and that requires strength. What does to live or die for the Lord mean? We live in order to honor the Lord. We live that men may praise the Lord. And then we live with this object of pleasing God. You know. I told you the story of John Hyde of India. It was, when he died, I think he was seeing 200 souls come to the Lord every day. But that guy is phenomenal. He will go to a meeting and people will ask him, John, it's time to eat. He will say, excuse me, I just ask the Lord. Lord, shall I eat today? He, he's, he's, he fasts the most. Of all men of God I've read in history, he fasted more than Moses, believe me. You know? He fasted more than Elijah. The second one that I know fasted the most was uh, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, Bill Bright. The founder of Campus, he was he's one of the most spiritual men of our time. He's with the Lord now. But that guy is a phenomenal question. They live their life for God. You know, we should start living our life for God too. And start showing our spiritual strength by how we live. Amen? Amen. Learn something this morning? Amen. Praise God. We'll, we'll continue tonight. We'll talk about acts of spiritual strength tonight, okay? Let's all stand up.